All right, and we are live. Um, so I wanted to thank everyone for, for coming today. This is the first of hopefully many conversations mm -hmm. through, uh, I think I'm, I'm calling it Athenium Chats for the moment. If, uh, if anyone has a better name, let me know. <laughs> uh, but my name is Sean Watkins. I'm the owner of Athenium Comic Art. Um, we represent the original art of some of the best independent and alt cartoonists in the business. Um, and tonight we're talking to one of my favorite cartoonists, Jonathan Hill. Jonathan Hill uh, is a cartoonist uh, and author of a, of a bunch of different things, but um, Odessa came out in 2020. It won a Believer Book Award for graphic narrative, which was amazing, um, and has a new graphic novel coming out uh, on September 27th uh, called Tales of a Seventh Grade Lizard Boy. Thank you so much, Jonathan, for, for joining me tonight. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me, Sean, and thanks for doing this. I think that it's, uh, I think it's really exciting, um, sort of next step in what you're doing at Athenium, and just, uh, you know, you have such an amazing roster of artists that you're working with, and just your love and passion for, for art and the community, and I just, I'm really excited for you to find new ways to sort of have that and able to reach out to more people and bring more, excuse me, more people together. Yeah. Well, well, thank you for, for um, being willing to, to try this out with me. <laughs> I think it'll take a little bit to, to figure out the, the format for, for these chats, but uh, we always have really good conversations uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, privately. So I'm excited to, to talk to folks um, in the room tonight. And there, there's some, some folks from the Discord coming in, uh, Sleepy Reader and, and Mark. Thanks for coming. Cool. Um, so the theme doing. of the night is creativity process and industry. Um, we have a bunch of talking points and questions. Feel free to, to shoot some questions in the comments and, and maybe we'll get to them. Um, we kind of wanted to make this an organic conversation um, and make it less of a book talk, although and we'll, we'll for sure talk a little bit about Tales of a Seventh Grade Lizard Boy, which I, I love that title, by the way. <laughs> um, but we wanted to, to kind of perhaps pull the curtain back a little bit on, on cartooning and the, the comic book industry through the eyes of, of Jonathan. Um, but before we get into the sort of meat of, of the conversation tonight, I wonder, um, could you tell us a little bit about your journey as, as an artist? Um, when did you decide to become a cartoonist? Yeah, so, um, so it, it's been a weird I mean, everyone has their own sort of different story, but I think mine was, you know, I always liked to draw as a kid. Um, I had no idea what that meant once, it, you know, you, you get to high school, you know, your junior year, you have to start thinking about where you're going to go to school because as 16 or 17 years old, you have to start planning out the rest of your life. But um, I didn't know how to, what to do with that, what to do with that, sure. that love of art. Um, and so when it came time to, um, to go to college, um, I applied to a bunch of different art schools, but I didn't know, or schools, just didn't know what I wanted to do with that. I ended up going to SCAD, which at the time was probably one of the only schools that had a sequential art department, but mm -hmm. that isn't why I went. Um, I didn't really, outside of reading, a, a, you know, newspaper comics, and uh, it was back in, back when you could still pick up like comics at the grocery store, you know what I mean? So like, yeah. I'd pick up like an issue of Spider-Man or X-Men or something, but nothing really um, intensely. Um, but I went to, so I went to SCAD and I majored in illustration because I was just like, okay, I like to draw. Illustration is drawing, I guess. I, I didn't know. I didn't, I had no concept of it. All right. Of like, how yeah. do I take this thing and make, make a, a career of it, make a living of it. Um, and I was a couple years, I was two years into the illustration program and I, I hated it. Mm. Um, I was bored out of my mind. And um, if anybody here are illustrators or fans of it, like I, I, it, I don't mean to disparage that. I just, it wasn't for me. I, I don't think sure. in terms of like a lot of it was editorial work. I don't think, I don't like conceptualize like that. I think mm. I'm, a, I've always been sort of like a narrative artist. I like telling stories, even if they were just, I hadn't made comics, they were just single images. Um, but I had a friend, you know, he was my, my neighbor in the dorms the first year, my friend, Jason Rainey, he was like, well, you know, you like, you like telling stories, you like drawing, why don't you try majoring in comics? And I was like, that's, a horrible idea <laughs> um why would i do that but i was really unhappy um and so i took an intro class and i fell in love with it sort of immediately mm -hmm. and um the the person who taught intro was so so but the ta john lowe who's the chair of the sequential art department now in scad he was i just i, I feel like it's sort of because of him 
that I stuck with it because he was someone that was just like, Hey, you've got a lot of things you need to work on, but there's something really here. Like he's, he saw something in me and he mm. tried to pull that out of me. And it was just that nudge that like for better, for worse, you know, this was, that was sort of the, the, the crossroads in which I decided to co- sort of stick with it. And then I, you know, that's sort of where I, that's, that's when I learned about comics was in college, you know? Mm. So there's, there's often these conversations and I, I kind of, as a, as a, um, a lover of comic book art and cartoonist, mm-hmm. I sort of snoop around and, and hang out in some of these cartoonist spaces. And there's a sort of debate over whether or not folks should go to art school at all. Would you, would you recommend that, that, that people do that to kind of help their career in cartooning or is it very specific to the individual's um, journey? I, well, I think, I mean, I get this, I would get this question a lot as well um, yeah. because I was a teacher. I taught, um, right. you know, I taught art, um, at places around town. I taught middle school and high school. I taught at a college level at the Pacific Northwest College of Art. Um, I taught through literary arts. And I would get this question a lot because I would teach teach college students and I would teach high schoolers sort of getting ready to take that step. And, you know, for my experience, I, as I just said, like, I, I needed that. Hmm. I needed to sort of like, I needed school to be like, here's this thing. How do you turn this? How do you sort of like temper that into something that could become a career, which I didn't have a career when I came out of college. Do you know what I mean? But I needed that to find, I wouldn't have found it without that. And so my answer is generally like, I mean, I have such mixed feelings about it too, because (laughs) I love teaching, but teaching at art school can also feel like teaching. It's like you're participating in a Ponzi scheme. (laughs) It costs costs so much, so much money, Right. so much money. It costs so much money when I was there. And then when I would talk to students about how much they were paying to go to art school, I would like crap my pants and realize <laughs> that like, if I were their age now, I would not have been able to go to art school, just quite frankly. But I think now there are way more resources available um, that I don't, I would say that I don't think you need to go to art school. I would say mm-hmm. if you have the means, there's a lot of benefits from it. Um, again, and I've worked with students who like you, you have built in community you have resources right. in terms of just technology resources in terms of connections in terms of like you know who who are your faculty and who are they you know what i mean like how can they you know can they put a word in for things if they love your work how can they advocate right. for you what does that lead to you know what i mean um but at the same time like i you don't need it at all i think the fact that but are you someone who can be motivated to teach yourself, to push yourself, to know where your weaknesses are, know what your strengths are. Like, can you build, can you find your community? Can you make a community? You know what I mean? Like all, like, so it is, it's technically possible to learn all of the things that I learned in art school from like watching YouTube videos, being on Twitter, talking to people, going to things. Well, I don't know, going to things because of where we are right now, but like, you know what I mean? But like, you have to have an incredible sense of discipline, right? of self-motivation, and like for me, I'm a hardworking person who's disciplined. But at 18 years old, I, I I didn't have that sense of what I needed to do. But the resources also weren't there. You know what I mean? Like like nowadays, someone could be like, "How does how does Jonathan draw? Or how does this other artist draw?" But piped in Google, and then you pull up a blog where they're going in detail on like what brush they use, what paper they use, right. videos of their technique, et cetera, et cetera, that you can like have access to that. Like. For me, who just drew and like on typing paper my whole life, what I don't, I didn't know any of those things, you know, does does that make sense? I know that was very long winded, but. um, No, I love it. I love it. And, and I guess that this might be a good, we're going to just jump around a little bit. I think Mm -hmm. Um, this might be a good transition to talk. You, you, you had mentioned that you're a, you know, disciplined and a hard worker. I wonder if you could talk about like, what is your daily experience with, with cartooning, right? Like how, what is your, your process? Well, I mean, the process, the process changes for each sort of part of, okay. of yeah. the process. But like, um, I mean, I think the biggest thing is like, you have to treat it like a job. Right. Do you know what I mean? Like, I think when I first um, sort of quit my day jobs to try to start doing this, it took a long time to get going because I would like stay up till three and sleep until 11 and then get up and eat breakfast and then maybe watch some TV or play some video games. And then I, I wouldn't get started till like two. And then, you know, my wife would get home at five and then I'd be like, well, she's home. I got to like, mm-hmm. I want, I want to spend time with her. And 
so I'm getting two or three hours of work done a day. And that was like, you know, you get that out of your, I think you need to get that out of your system a little bit because there's a free, it, it goes back to that discipline that we're talking about. Like, you know what I mean? Like it, right. I think that a lot of people just think it's this like cruising, especially people that aren't artists, you know, I think it's like, oh, this is life of like, you know, living in your pajamas and like, but if you want to be successful at it, you have to get the work done. And I think it changed when I was like, you know, when I really started to be able to make it happen, it's like, no, you know, get up at nine, work, work until five, take breaks. You know what I mean? Like, even right. if you're in the zone and that's just for your body as I'm getting older, you know, like my wrist or my back or my shoulders or things can't stand the grind as, as, you know, as long as I used to be able to. And then trying to, you know, balance that work life and, you know, trying to get done at five. So that's what it is like for me now, you know, and that's, that's really when I'm drawing, mm -hmm. drawing, because drawing is just like work ahead of you that you have to, you have to complete. Um, writing is a little bit different because writing is so hard. Um, it's like pure thinking, which as a brain, as a muscle is like so exhausting, you know? Right. Um, so it's a little bit different because I have to sort of jump around and um do other things to like let things like brew a little bit you know yeah could you talk a little bit about how that i mean i i i think a lot about the the world we live in that's super fast paced we have a lot of distractions there's I mean, video games and social media and etc mm -hmm. and uh, and and work like constant work for those of us who are you know who, who uh who work crazy jobs um how do you build in that time to to think and to process and to is it very structured um or or do you, does it do, you know do you go on walks and it just sort of these ideas come to you like how, how does it work for you i think i mean i think i, I love that question i think it, it's like it's a complicated question because i think this ties i think this ties into a bigger thing where like or this other thing about making art, we're here, I'm talking about making art and I'm saying like, oh, you have to be disciplined. It's a job. You have to work. Right. And that's, and that's true. Right. But it also makes me think back to when I was in school and one of, I mean, my, my mentor and one of the best teachers I've ever had was the late great Ted Stern, hmm. um, who he used to be a storyboard artist and he's done a series um, for, he did a series for Fanographics called Fuzz and Pluck. Um, I think it's probably one of the most underrated comics of all time. Um, and if you get a chance, if anyone here is watching and you're looking for something really good to read, and if, if you appreciate like good art, good cartooning as a drafts person, um, he was just exceptional, but also as a storyteller. But he, you know, I think the thing is he really, when he was teaching, it was these technical things, but I think he really dug and made us ask, like, he asked us, like, well, why are you even making this thing? Yeah. What's the point of this thing? Why are you even doing this? And not in a like a, a bullying way, but just like, right. why? Why are you doing this? Like, why, why do I need to tell this? What is the story trying to say? What am I trying to do with it? And, you know, I think that that really hit me in a way, too, because I think being an, and I, I'm not trying to make myself like, or make artists more like self grandeurizing or whatever, but just like it's conveying the human experience, right? Right. Like in, in something, whether you're, you know, ideally, like not that there can't be, you know, like there's escape, but there's all sorts of types of stories. But generally, it's like you want to say something about the human condition, you know, whether you're making movies or comics or whatever. And so it's like, but as an artist, if you if you don't have something to say about the human condition, what's the point? Right. And so, like, yeah. as an artist, I think it's your job to to, like, live your life get as many ex experiences as you can, like observe the world though too, you know what I mean? Like whether that means like, you know, falling in love and getting your heart broken and yeah. do doing these things. But it also means just like taking, like you said, taking a moment and taking a breath and like, what are, what are the things that matter to you? What are the things you see in the world? What do you love? What are the things that make you sad? What, you know, like, and then you process that through yourself and then you put it out in your art, you know mm. what I mean? And so, so I think like writing is so interesting. Like, and it, like I do writing enough and then the drawing takes so long that I forget the process of writing when I have to write again. <laughs> but like, it's so hard because it really is like, sometimes it comes in fits and spurts of like, I have this idea. Mm -hmm. How do I get to this idea? Plot wise, how do I get to this idea? And you kind of have to feel it through. You kind of have to just like, I, I think writing is hard because a lot of it is failing. 
which we're right. not used to. Like people aren't used to that. Like I'm not used to that. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, but you have to be like, this happens and this happens. Like it's like you, it's like you're in a forest, and you have to follow a path that might be miles long to decide if it's the way out. And then you get to the end, and you're like, actually, this wasn't the way. That, this isn't where I needed to go. But that, but you, and you have to be okay with that. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, does, yeah, yeah. does that make sense? I know I'm yeah. being so like. I mean, I'm a spaz anyway, and if anybody hasn't ever heard me, te- if I have students in the, you know, in the audience, you you know this, but like for anybody that doesn't, it's like, but but that's what I think writing is is writing is like, you're you're having to like, make connections and like sometimes they won't go anywhere, but you have to like think that through and then try again and try again right. until like you're making. I think another way to put it is like you're you're make you're putting puzzle pieces together but you're making the puzzle pieces at the same time and you don't know if those puzzle pieces will work or not <laughs> you know what i mean yeah 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 um so so do you script out your your projects first how does that what does that process look like no i don't what i do is and i don't have i thought i might have some here my desk is such a mess um I, I don't. What I do is I write every I write ideas by hand on mm. paper. On like I take a sheet of typing paper and I tear it in half, and I just have a bunch of sheets of typing paper, and then I just sort of write ideas down. Or I take like actually I think I have this is for the second lizard boy. Ooh. Um. And so I did this a little bit differently. I mean, it did start is like I literally what I'll do is I'll just take sticky notes. <laughs> I love and it. Every, every single idea I have, I put wow. on a sticky note. Um, and so, so it's that thing of just like not, you can't have the perfect, I, I, like there's not going to be a perfect idea. You just have to like get every idea you can. And then it's making those puzzle pieces, right? right. And then, you know, so this is like big themes, right? Um, and then once I have those, once I have those puzzle pieces, then I'll sort of like start like trying to lay them out or put them in a little bit more of an order or like, um, and this process has changed, you know, over books. So then it gets to like, okay, here, sorry, I'm like, it's uh, like, here's chapter one. And then now I'm organizing those thoughts in a more like linear way. But the thing about the sticky notes it is, um, well, a, and a thing about writing by hand is like, I can't type because if I type, if it's not the perfect idea right away, mm. I delete it and I don't get anywhere. Whereas like writing with a pen is a way for me to sort of like allow myself to have that idea and let it exist and not judge it, whether it's good or bad, you know what I mean? Yeah. And then I can sort it through as sticky notes. Then I could sort it through and be like, which puzzle pieces do I want to use? And then I'll put those together. That's so interesting. I love how, how analog it is. I, I, I journal by hand just for, for mostly for fun. Um, and, and as much as I try to take notes at work or other places on the computer, it just doesn't, it doesn't sink in the same mm-hmm. way. It, like that, that sort of like motor memory, I suppose, of, of like jotting it down, even if I never read it again, it like sticks in my brain better. It's really yeah, interesting. A hundred percent. And I think, I mean, I, if I was more prepared, I might have like an article to link to or something. But like, I think there have been studies done that that act of pencil to paper helps you learn and helps you like, I'm the same way. Like I have all of the, these are just like notes. Um, these, but these are really boring because these are just notes for all like the nonprofits or anything or like other work that I have that are just like, but I'll never look at this notebook again. Once I fill this notebook, I'll put it on right. my shelf. I'm never going to look at it again, but it's just, it's a way for me to remember everything that's happening in work or in meetings or these other things that I have to do. So, yeah. So I feel like this is a good uh, moment to, to, to contrast sort of this, this analog um, experience of, Mm. of, of the world versus your um, uh, mostly working digital. Um, And I'd be curious to hear, I, I think I have some ideas as to why why you switched to to, to digital at a certain point. I, th- I think you you did you work traditionally at all, kind of at a larger scale, or or did you? Yeah, my over- first my first book, Americus, was That's done right. did, was done um, analog, and then a lot of my comics, you know, up, up until you know maybe I mean what year is it now? I don't even know. <laughs> Uh, um, COVID year. That's what it yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, you know, but um, up until very recent, I mean, Odessa was my first book mm. fully digital um 
but you know so everything else sort of before then was done analog so i wonder if you could talk through wh why you you made that change and some of the the benefits of working digitally and maybe some of the the challenges yeah um i mean ultimately so uh, you know i think there were a couple things sort of happening is um, I think digital tools were becoming more affordable and yeah. cheaper. Like I, you know, don't have a lot of money, you know <laughs> what I mean? And I haven't, but like when, when those things, I think, you know, like before it's like, Oh, a Cintiq was the only way you used to be able yeah. to draw digitally. Do you have two and a half grand to splurge on a Cintiq? You know what I mean? Like, no, you know what I mean? I, 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 I didn't, but then there were some Chinese brands that were making like, more affordable options and were quality like maybe not the, the quality of Cintiq but it's the difference between like a Honda Civic and like a BMW like the Honda Civic is still going to get you where you need to go right but like you know the Beamer is going to be it's going to drive smoother it's going to be quieter etc cetera, etc cetera. but the cost difference is there so I think there was that um and I think I just wanted to try it out you know what I mean um, right and so I how I actually started working digitally I worked this is probably the longest job I've had is I'm the staff illustrator for a very, very, very small newspaper in town called the Asian reporter. And they mm. have a, you know, every issue has a political cartoon. And um, so at the time, I mean, of course their publication has gone to twice a month now or once a month now because newspapers and magazine, it's, it's difficult, but um, yeah. you know, before I was doing it every week. And so what I started doing is as a way to practice, like learn how to, cause I think, drawing digitally is kind of totally different than drawing analog. Mm. Um, but just to try it out, that's what I did. And so it's this low pressure thing, right? Of like every week I have to do a, a political cartoon. Right. Why not? Like, I'm not going to, I don't want to like get a book and then practice. Drawing <laughs> yeah. digital, you know. And yeah. so like that, that get me, made me comfortable with it. But like, I mean, ultimately though, like I love drawing analog drawing with a brush and anybody that is, knows me, I hear me say this before. It's like drawing with a brush is probably one of the three greatest joys in my life. I don't know what those other two are, but <laughs> I know that inking is one of them because it's just so meditative and like, it's just you and the page and you can listen to music. You can sit quietly. I can put a audiobook on or a podcast on, but it's just like, it, it just that it, it's kind of like we're talking about that pencil to paper ink yeah. to paper the brush. It's just, it's such an amazing experience to me. But ultimately, like, there's a reality that kind of creeps in that, like, uh, the faster I get pages done, the faster a book gets finished, the faster I can get to my next book and get paid for my next book. You know what I mean? Like, and so it's not like I'm, I don't want to make it sound like I'm sacrificing. I mean, I am sacrificing something, right? I'm sacrificing something. I mean, I'm sacrificing this love at sort of the altar of efficiency. But ultimately, like, I want to tell this, like, telling the story is the most important thing. And right. anything I can do, like realistically, just like if someone told you like, hey, you can do this thing that shaves, that saves hours of your life. Are you going to do it? You know, and I know some people value that, like they, they, they really value that art and that page, um, that, that analog page, uh, you know, a lot. And it was, it wasn't an easy decision originally when I was working on it. So Odessa was my first book mm -hmm. completely done digitally. Originally I was going to pencil it digitally print it out in blue line and ink it so that oh, I'd wow. still, I'd still have that. I'd have the benefits Good. of working digitally and, and like sort of like being able to be looser and freer with your, with your work. And, you know, like, but then I'd still have that analog experience, but I was drawing my pencils so tight <laughs> that I showed, I, I showed a student um, and they were like, what do you, why would you ink this? This is basically a finished page. And then I just color held the page and filled all the line work black the pencils mm. yeah right i the pencils were like red on red line um i i filled them black and it looked like an ink page and wow. I, I i literally just saved eight to ten hours of my life you know what i mean and yeah. so like i think seeing that seeing how much faster that made things right uh, like literally in real time in like two seconds um it, it, it was just like i think i want to try to switch to this because at the time too i was juggling teaching working on odessa doing freelance work, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's like, that was one less thing I had to think about, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about the, the economics of, of cartooning. I mean, generally, um, I, I, there, 
I, I see some some friendly folks in the in the comments here, um, and they may know a little bit about uh, how how the world of comic books works. But I think one of the the things that and I'd mentioned this at a, a different interview that I had partaken in, um, I was really surprised to find out how. Um, terrible pay is for artists in the, the comic book world. Um, you know, as a, as a kid who really wanted to draw, right. I'd love to draw, but I wasn't great at it. I wasn't, people didn't, didn't support that, that love in the way that maybe they could have. Um, you know, I looked at folks like you and I still look at folks like you mm. as, as superheroes themselves, right? Like being able to take something in your brain and, and, and actualize it on the page is just like magic to me. Um, and when I, when I have, now that I've had a lot of conversations mm -hmm. with many cartoonists and cartoonists who are very well known, um, and you talk about the, the, the sort of economics behind it, it was really shocking to me. And, and a big reason why I wanted to start Athenium was to, to be able to support folks and give them a, um, another source of, of, um, uh, of money um, on the side to, to allow them to focus more on the art. So I'm curious, you know, if you could talk sort of generally about what the, the world is like. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that there are, there's sort of two different sort of areas I think in comics right now and some of you know that there's some that blur the lines a little bit but there's going to be more direct market stuff right. which we used to call main mainstream comics but that is not the case anymore so like direct market would be stuff that right. goes to like comic shops you know what I mean like superhero books uh, Marvel DC image that sort of thing a lot of those books um, unless if it's not creator owned are going to be you're going to get a page rate Right. Um, and they're, but they're also going to be sort of existing IPs most of the time. Right. And so like your page rate can be pretty, you know, most of the time, unless you're sort of like a bigger working on a bigger book for a bigger company, your page rate's going to be pretty low. Um, right. and, and then you're not going to get any, generally you're not going to get any royalties for that. It's work for hire. Right. So you get a page rate for how many pages you're getting done. And then it's, it's done, you know, you're, you're done with that. The other sort of side of that is the book market, um, right. which is where most of my work um, is in. And so for a book market, how that works is generally you get an advance. Right. And an advance is, I think some, a lot of people get this wrong, but an advance is short for advance on royalties. So you don't get, that's not, you're not getting paid to make this book. You're basically getting a check that will get, taken out you have to pay that check back before right. you start to see royalties on it so for like a smaller publisher your advance might only be like five hundred dollars or a thousand dollars right right and then your you know and then so whereas like a bigger publisher your advance might be somewhat like you know twenty thousand dollars fifty thousand dollars a hundred thousand dollars something like that you know or not your advance your total pay so it's like you know if you're advanced it's a year say you're advanced, say you're getting paid you're like the total pay for the book is going to be $40,000 maybe. Mm -hmm. um, you would get 20 first, like 20 and it, as an advance and then 20 on completion, but you still have to pay all of that back before you start to see royalties. And, and so like some people might think like, oh, a smaller publisher, if they're only going to pay you $1,000 for the book or for your advance, like that's like, that's a bad deal. Whereas like if this other publisher comes in and your advance is, you know, a hundred thousand dollars, you're getting $50,000 up front. Like, obviously you're going to pick that one. The downside of that is like, we're talking about like, you have to pay that back. So the thing right. is, is like Odessa had a very small advance because only I love them to work with it, but they're a small publisher, right? Right. I paid that advance back the first month of Odessa being on sale. And so now I'm seeing royalties on um, Odessa. Whereas like working for a bigger company like Macmillan or for a second, you know what I mean? Where my advance you know, might be like the total advance might be like $15,000 or $20,000 or something like that. Um, I, I didn't or like, so the last book I did for Macmillan was the wild weather book, which actually those science comics sell really well because there's a built in market to like mm -hmm. libraries and educators and things like that. Um, it took two or three years for me to earn that advance back. So only now am I earning royalties on that where, wow. and the thing is too, is like the artist makes more, than the writer so like mk my friend she earned out sooner than i did because her advance um was smaller because mm. the, the artist gets so like so you know what i mean so like all of those things sort of 
there's a balance to all of those things right, right? um and so yeah i don't know if that answers your question or if that gives like an easy rundown but like i i think it's what's important to, especially for for certain companies certain publishers people in the direct market the page rate is insultingly low if you right. think of if you think of work per hour like how long it takes you to draw a page do you know what i mean like right. um and then even some you know and then so at least with like publishers like even a small publisher yes the pay like yes the advance is small but i mean but here's the thing too is like so ideally you can earn out sooner and get advances but the thing is is those smaller publishers the way their business model is is they're making books so many books every year that like your book falls out of the my marketing cycle very very quickly right so your advances are going to drop or your royalties are going to drop after a little bit because they just don't have the resources to continually promote all the books I have when, it, when they have 20 other books coming out a year. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, and I, I can't remember when, so Odessa came out in 2020. Um, yeah. Correct. Mm -hmm. So that would be trying to think about the, the effects of COVID on, on all of this, this stuff, right. On, um, you know, you heard all these stories about people's books being trapped on, on, uh, ships in the middle yeah. of nowhere and, yeah. and et cetera. Did you, I mean, uh, Odessa seems to be a really pop popular book from, from, from my point of view, but, um, did you see any effects of, of COVID on, I mean, we could talk a lot yeah, about I mean, COVID. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to say because I think that I think books are in a better spot now because people have adjusted. I yeah. think a lot of those books that came out, especially, you know, like I have friends, like my friend Brina, her book, it was her first book came out May of right. 2020. We're still watching that tiger guy show on Netflix and baking bread in May, 2020, like thinking that it's going to be over in a month, you know what I mean? Right. Yeah. But we're still in a complete lockdown. Whereas I think books that are coming out now are, are in a little better shape because mm -hmm. people are, you know, because I think, especially for new authors, it was devastating right. because there's, you don't have a bookseller hand selling uh, like, Oh my God, this, here's this new author. You got to check this out. Like, I love this book. People like sales numbers were basically people going back to creators that they already knew. So I think right. creators that had, and I'm like in a weird place because I'm not like, I'm not a new, I'm not a new author, but that was the first book I had written myself because my previous books have done, have been done with MK. And I, I think, you know, I mean, just like realistically, I think Odessa was really, really well regarded in a lot of ways. Like again, it won the Believer Book Award. It was a, it was a short list on the short list for um, the PNBA Award. Yeah. Um, it, um, you know, Dave Pilkey had really great things to say. Um, Jeff Smith had great, like so many great authors that read it and artists yeah. that read it, like had so many great things to say about it, but you know, sales were okay. You know what I mean? And I don't know, some of that is just like, I think some of that is COVID. And I think some of that is just like, you know, so just competition with a lot of other books, you know, there's a lot, like we were saying before, there's a lot of um, things competing for our attention. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I wonder if, if you're comfortable talking about, um, you know, with your new book coming out and the difficulties of <laughs> kind of weighing the cost benefits of, of actually going out and promoting it physically versus doing more remote, remote, um, you know, remote book talks and things like that. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I'll admit, I was like super bummed. Like I, you know, for Odessa, it was like, this was the first book I had written myself this was my thing for better for worse whether people loved it or hated it like i get to take all of that and i right. you know i i really missed having the opportunity to like be in person and talk to people about it and just like be ex be excited about it and share that excitement with people um and so now like you said so i have this book coming out in september and you know, my publisher in our contract, like they were going to fly me out to shows and promote the book because they were really excited for it. And I was excited for that too. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I got an email from the publicist. It was like, Hey, I'm just checking in books coming out soon. What conventions are you going to go to? Let's try to organize this. And um, they were like, you know, very great about being like, you know, they've had to publicists have had to do the like a lot of work this last year and be flexible and nimble and adapting to every situation because it is sort of like, every instance is different but you know i thought long and hard about it and i was like oh and also like if it helps 
to put things in context is I, I'm immunocompromised. I had a kidney transplant um, five years ago, six years ago. So like I am very, very vulnerable because I'm on medicine that basically makes it so my kidney won't, my body won't reject my kidney. So like I, um, yeah, I'm, yeah, it's COVID is, you know, I think there's like, like people that are immunocompromised have like a 500% chance of being hospitalized or dead because of COVID. Um, so, so I, so I have to weigh that <laughs> against, right. Okay. Cons are, cons are like cons were happening last year, but like now here's me thinking if I'm going to go to a con, but a lot of cons have removed vaccination checks, mask mandates, mask requirements. So like, you know, there were times where I thought about like, could I do it? Like, could I just be on a panel? But even right. a panel, you're in a closed room, you know, air, a bunch of people in a room next to people, you know what I mean? Like it's, I mean, I guess I could wear a mask, but it's still like, ultimately I, I, I told my publicist that I was like, realistically, I don't think I can do, I can't go to any conventions. You know, I think I'm going to do book, like smaller bookstore events because those are a little bit more controlled that we can right. like ask people to wear masks or be considered, you know, I can be distanced from them. I can wear a mask, that sort of thing. But it's just like that, that seemed like the compromise, you know? Right. Um, and it's, it's a bummer because I think, but it's funny because at the same time, I think and like realistically comic conventions are more for like peer facing, right. Um, like acknowledgement of your book where like most like, you know, I work, I do YA stuff in middle grade. I do youth publishing. So like most of the people that publish that pick up my book, aren't going to be going to convention you know what I mean like um so that was or maybe I'm just telling myself that to like feel better about it but yeah it was a, it was a really really hard decision and so you know yeah but I think it's a decision I had to make yeah and I and thank you for 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 talking about that because I think it's it's so important to be to to I feel like th those types of stories are not the stories we're hearing very often, right? It's like, we're, we're going back to normal. We don't have to worry about this, even though numbers are going up, et cetera, et cetera. And I think there's a whole group of folks who, who are not experiencing it and experiencing the world and COVID in that same way. And I think it's at the very least important to acknowledge that that sort of journey and how, how much pain and, and trauma is involved with that. I mean, we've all lived through this for the past few years. But, you know, it's it's not everyone is sort of equal in terms of moving forward with yeah. it. Um, so. So, yeah, thank you. I wanted to, to talk about connecting with fans. You know, one of the things we've talked about in selling your original art is like, how amazing would it be to to connect with young people who love your books? I mean, I'm an, I'm an old a middle aged person who loves your books as well. And I bought pages from you. Um, but but sort of. You know, you're we're one of the the couple of folks, growing number of folks uh, on the Athenium team that that work in the the YA realm, and I, I don't know. I'd be curious to hear, you know, how 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 do you connect with with fans? Is it you kind of put the book out there and you hope for the best? Is it? I mean. I mean, there's a lot of different things we could talk about, I suppose, as well. And like thinking about how, how to write the book and the audience and, and, and that sort of thing. But uh, I guess we could start with, yeah, like how, how do you think of your, how do you think about, how, how do you connect with, with fans of your work? You know, I don't know. I would and again, maybe I'm not the best author to answer this question because I sort of make the book and then I, you know, have done things, you know, through like I do school visits sometimes I do like sure. library visits, things like that. But like, realistically, I think where most people are finding the books are through like librarians, you know what I mean? Like, right. and teachers or things like that. I mean, more so librarians um, because I think they're just such fierce readers and fierce advocates for, for books and reading. And, you know, so I think that's what, like, I don't, I'm not, I, I think it's something that I, could be better at and maybe should be better at is like sure. being being more of a presence. I mean, but it's a thing like on online. Like part of me is like, do I be a presence online? But realistically, like, who are the people that are following me? There are other, there are other creators. You know what I mean? There are other people. Like you know, it's not a lot of folks who I don't know. It, it's tough. But then I also see folks, especially I, I guess apparently like, um, book, um, TikTok is a huge thing. Yeah, I've heard that. 
And, you know, I have a lot of friends who are just like, oh, God, do we need to learn how to do TikTok? TikTok? <laughs> you know, like, but, you know, there's certain there's certain creators out there that are just making content, like so much content and, and reaching audiences in a way that like, you know, other other creators aren't. And I think especially with between COVID and geography, like that's the nice thing about the Internet is that it kind of destroys the geography and it makes certain right. things accessible. So like, OK, maybe you couldn't go to a you know, you couldn't see your favorite author at a reading, go to a reading, but like you could see them here or you could see them on TikTok and interact with them there. So like, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not saying it's good or bad or I'm not rolling my eyes at social media or anything at all whatsoever. But I think it's like, I'm still navigating that because I mean, ultimately I just want to get famous enough that I don't have to do social media. Um, <laughs> uh, that, uh, literally every single um, artist I work with says that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, because I think that's all what we, that's how we all feel, right? Um, but some people are so good at it and so do it in a natural way that doesn't feel like cheesy. I mean, even being at a convention, I, to be, to be honest, like I hate tabling at conventions. Yeah. Um, I like doing panels and I like seeing friends and people and fans, but like sitting at a table for like four days, one day shows are the best. Um, Cause I can <laughs> handle that. But like four days of a show, five days show where yeah. you're just sitting there and like, it's, <clears throat> it's real awkward. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, Let's see. So in terms of, um, I mean, the social media stuff is interesting, right? Because you all are, aren't making millions of dollars doing this work, right? And and having to dedicate, you know, it's almost a full-time job to, you, you see some of, there's there's some really impressive um, cartoonists who are using TikTok to, to kind of creatively uh, show their work. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know where they find the time to do it, to be perfectly honest. Like it's so polished and, and it looks amazing and, and it seems authentic. Um, you know, I, I, for me as a, as an outsider thinking about, you know, just, just how you survive as a cartoonist. I mean, I guess that's a question. Like, how do you survive as a cartoonist? Uh, especially if you're, you're kind of uh, doing it full time. I mean, most, most people I, I follow, um, you know, are working other other jobs mm -hmm. to, to kind of make ends meet. Um, you know, how how maybe this is for for artists and, and um, uh, you know, for the interest of folks who are watching, but how how can you make it work? I mean, I think I mean, I think you, you have to be open to like doing other things. Like, I think that like you have to be realistic in being like, I am not going like you're probably you're not going to make a living off it um right away right. and if maybe not for a very long time but you're hopefully you're doing it because you love it and again you you want to tell you love telling stories you want to share those stories and those experiences but like you might have to get a j job you might have to get two day jobs you might have to you know and again I, I say that you know i did that for a really long time like when i first graduated and i moved to portland i worked at whole foods um you know for a couple of years and my whole thing was like i i I didn't love that job, but in a way I loved it because I was like, let's keep my responsibility as low as possible. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, what's the least amount of hours I can work and get like health benefits. You know what I mean? Right. So yeah. I only worked four days. Um, I was just a, I was like a grocery store, like a bagger. You know what I mean? Like I did, I had to do some cashiering, but then I just was like, no, I'll even just do bagging and like sweeping and stuff because I was like, you know, there were times where like, oh, do you like, you should apply for this job. And I was like, no, because I don't want this to be my job. I want this to be the thing that I go to and I'll make money and then I'll do this other thing. You know what I mean? So like I kept, right. it was just like, what was the lowest responsibility I could have possible? You know what I mean? So it's yeah. not taking away, you know, whereas like some, some folks I know who were like, okay, they go, they find this job and then this job becomes, and a, again, I'm not, everybody sort of has their own way of how they make it through it. But for me, that was sort of my priority was like doing that. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, I ended up quitting that job and working at Powell's, which I think was better because I, I was around books and I, you know, I was, I ran sections of like illustration and graphic design and artists and our history. And so like there, I'm actually like being like that helped a little yeah. bit, but it's still ultimately it was still like, what's the least amount of work I can do. Like, I don't want to like apply for these higher jobs in the company because I want, I wanted art to be a thing, you know what I mean? Right. Um, and then, I mean, even when I worked, when I quit that job to work full-time, I still was doing part-time work 
teaching. You know what I mean? Right. So it's like, it wasn't until, it wasn't until my last book that I was able to like work full time. It took me, you know, however many years, 20, 2020. So when I graduated, so 20, 2004, 2003, it took me 16, 17 years to get to the point where I was just doing comics. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but I wouldn't have it any other way. I think I learned, right. you know, like you learn, you learn so much, like nothing is, no learning is wasted. You know, I think I was talking, I was on another panel for, it was like a person of like a, a BIPOC sort of publishing group. And we were talking about our stories and everything. And I was talking about how like, you know, I was a waiter the whole time I was in SCAD. And that, like, that taught me so many skills about like just how to work with people. How, right. You know, and so like one of the biggest things I learned is like people don't mind waiting, but they hate to be forgotten. So if you mm. tell someone their order's coming and it's just it's taking a little bit instead of just ghosting them and annoy, like that's how you treat working with an editor too, right? Like if you're behind, tell your editor you're behind. But I know right. these the, I know a lot of these young cartoonists that just don't have these skills because they like get out of college and they sign a book deal, but they and that's great, that's awesome for them. But then they don't know how to like, so they're like behind other pages and they're having this like anxiety attack and they don't talk to their editor for like six months. And, and then it's like, you know, that like, does the book get canned or what happens there? You know what I mean? Like, because, you know, so like, again, like that, I, every single job I've done, I think has like given me skills and experience that make what I do mm -hmm. now better. Because being an artist, like you, we were just talking about being an artist isn't just about making art. You have to learn how to connect to community, participate in community, reach out, talk about your books, deal with, you know, especially as a freelance illustrator, you know, negotiating contracts, um, asking to get paid, hounding people if they don't pay you, you know, like there's so many things that go into being an artist. It's not just like the drawing. Right. 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 And I, I love, I mean, in our conversations, I think both of us, we really um, appreciate community um, and, and giving back to communities. And I think there, there are two train of thoughts that I'd love to, for you to talk a little bit more about, um, teaching and, and your nonprofit work. Uh, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about your experiences as a teacher. I mean, just talking, to, I'm, I, I spent a lot of time in the, in the educational world. And I, as you talk, every time I talk to you, I, I, I feel better about myself a little bit. Um, you, you talk like a teacher, you're so supportive. Um, you're, you're so creative, you can explain things well. Um, it's really impressive. And I wonder, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what you've learned as a teacher over the years and, and how you've applied that to your professional life. Yeah. I mean, I think, I mean, I think one of the reasons, I mean, my mom's a teacher, she's been a teacher for a long time. I think just like, like helping people out, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but I think, I think for, especially for me is, you know, just talking about like John Lowe and Ted Stern and some of those other teachers I had and just thinking about throughout my whole life and just like how important it is to have someone tell you that you can do it and encourage you to do it in big or small ways, whether that is like your, your uncle or your mom teaching you how to ride a bike and just like being like, no, you can, like, you're afraid of doing it. Right. Like, like you can fall, you can break your bones, you can blah, 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 blah. But like literally just having someone like, no, you can do it. Like, you know, and, and then just like pushing them in that moment when you're riding your bike and you're just like, holy shit, I am doing it. I can ride a bike. <laughs> so it's just like, yeah, we all need someone in our lives to do that, whether, you know what I mean? And so it's just like, if I had those people that told, you know, like having John Lowe be like, hey, you can do this. Like you, you have to work. You have yeah. a lot of work to do, but you can do this. Or having Ted also like do that, just push you. It's just like people lift you up and it's just like, how do you, how do you pay that back? Yes. Yes. It's like overwhelming. It makes me tear up. Like now thinking about it, it's like the only way I feel like I can pay them back and pay the people in my life back is like by pulling other people up with me. You know right. what I mean? Yeah. And yeah. Um, I just feel like that's just like, that should just be your like life. That should just be a life motto, right? Like just like care about other people and like help all the other people out where you can. And, and so, I mean, I think that there's that element to it. And I think the thing, yeah, I know you asked about like what I've learned from teaching and like when I started teaching comics, like at the college level, I think it really helped me understand. It made me a better cartoonist because you have to completely deconstruct everything you're doing. Right. Like, I don't want to just teach someone like, here's how you ink. Here's how you decide what 
goes in this panel. Here's how you decide this. I have to think about why do I do that? Why do I make that decision? Where does that come from? And by completely deconstructing what you're doing, because I don't ever want to be a, be a position as a teacher where someone asks me, why do you do this? And be like, well, I just do it. Or I don't know. Like I want to be able to give them a reason to my thinking. And like, that is really, that's really intense. Like I'm sure, you know, people that are parents or other teachers are like, if you're ever teaching somebody anything, like you have to stop and be intentional and thoughtful because these things become habits to us. Right. Right. You know what I mean? Like the things that we do every day, not just in bean making art, but in like you and your job or anybody else in their life, it's just like you do something so many times and, but you don't think about it anymore, but there's actually a history of why you do that and how you do that. And I love that teaching gives me the opportunity to like, look at myself in that way, you know? Right. Yeah. 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 I just, I love everything you're saying. And I, I think it's also so important. I know you do this is to, to thank your mentors, thank your teachers. Remember, it's so important. Like for those of you who are, who are watching, if you can think of a teacher that, that really was impactful, send them, a, send, them a te- send them a message, send them an email. Like it's so meaningful. I, I was a teacher for a little bit back in the day. And just, just having someone come out of the blue and say how impactful some, you know, something that you thought was like, I don't know, like, like a terrible class or like I've had students who I thought could care less about being in that class. And they're the ones that are always like, I loved it, like changed my life. It's just amazing. So we'll, we'll put that like positive energy out into the air and uh, uh, go, go contact a teacher. Um, (laughs) So I think actually the reason I discovered your work was you doing um, uh, a charity drawings for for one of the nonprofits that you you work with, and that's when I I saw Odessa mm-hmm. and I I picked it up and I was like, this is amazing. I, I love this person for both the 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 book itself, but also the 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 giving back to to um, your community. And I, I I wanted to give you some time to talk about the nonprofits that you work with and and kind of the the you know the passion you you put into into that work. Yeah, I mean, I guess so. The two big nonprofits that I work with right now is um, I work with Literary Arts in Portland. Um, I serve on the board of directors. Um, I this is my ten year anniversary being with them this year. Uh, but I started out. I start how I started out with the organization is I was they have a program called Writers in the Schools, and what you, it does is it takes professional writers, whether you're a, you know mm. a cartoonist or a poet or a playwright um, or like a you know journalist. And it puts you in a high school class and you do a 10 week residency. And so they get these, these students get to learn from you. You do a project with them. And so um, that was sort of how I started with that because it's, it's um, you know, the the mission is to sort of um, engage readers, encourage writers and inspire the next generation of literature. And so what it is, is like, that was, but that I got into that from teaching. You know, for, it was a teaching opportunity, so I got into that. But just seeing how the organization, like, it's it's a it's it kind of goes back to these things we're talking about. I was like, you know, like again, telling a high schooler, like, so I go into class, they're like, who is this weirdo? Like, who is this person? <laughs> what I'm I'm having to learn how to write. Oh man! And then this guy's asking me to learn how to draw. He's he's asking me to draw too. But it's not really about. It's really not about drawing. It's about right. teaching them different critical thinking, teaching them about the creative process of like. Again, like we were talking about before, making mistakes, feeling things right. through, being intentional, being thoughtful. And then also just like everybody has a story to tell. Like, I don't care if you consider yourself a writer or an artist. Everybody has lived experiences. Everybody can tell a story. And so like the whole mission of literary arts is to like the importance of literature, the importance of telling stories, whether you are a high schooler or whether you're like a Nobel Prize winning author. Like, yeah. how do we let's let's get people opportunity to tell the story so it just sort of grew from that where i was a wits writer for four years and then i couldn't do it anymore because of my schedule Mm -hmm. and they were like well do you want to be part of this committee that chairs that sort of guides the writers in the schools and i was like yeah i'd I'd love still to be connected in that way and then i did that for years and then they were like i you know you i and you know it's half a decade and i'm you know participating in all these things and they're like do you want to be on you know leadership would you like to be on the board of directors you know all that stuff because it's like that void you know like it's not just like literature like pinky up you know snobby <laughs> literature yeah, you know new right. york uh, but like literature's for everybody everybody yeah. has for, and so like that was that sort of like i just i love them to death um i'll probably do another 
you know, I raise money for them every year because I, I'm not a board member that can drop 10 grand sure. to like donate to them. But what I can do is I can do workshops. I can do classes. I can do art. It's the only time I do analog art. Yeah, I know. <laughs> year, the only time I do analog art anymore. Right. And I get I in there as quick as I can. I, I just I want that piece. Yeah, no, I appreciate you doing <laughs> that, Sean, you know, and I love that it's made, but that's just, I think that speaks like we're talking about community, like this chance sort of interaction, you know what I mean? And every time I talk to you, I, feel inspired and connected and like I love that that connection happened and how did it happen it didn't it didn't come from like me going to a convention and trying to like you know like I think there can, there's like a real schmoozy gross transactional side of like yeah community that people think of but it just came from us just loving a thing and yeah. sharing that love for a thing right you know yeah. what I mean like um Oh, and then the other one I should, I'll just, is uh, OK, OKU. It's an, uh, it's an organization that like, it uses uh, creativity. So writing and drawing to give st students and really anybody like um, a different way to reframe their anxiety. And so like, that was when I met the director, Kathleen, that I was like, that is like any emotional intelligence I have <laughs> is from being a creative, you know yeah, what I mean? And like yeah. learning how to take, like, Ugh. I mean, so much of my anxiety is from like, so much of my creativity comes from being anxious and being an, right. an, an anxious person, right? Like, you know, actually so many qualities I have come from being an anxious person. Like I'm very organized and I'm meticulous. What? That, that's from me being an anxious person because I don't want to mess up. So then I, <laughs> you, you know I, what can, I, mean? like, I can relate to that. Yeah. Yeah. And so like, so I just, and what I love about that work is now it literary arts. Now I'm at the point where I'm mostly involved in leadership, mm -hmm. but what I love about OKU is it lets me get down to the ground level and like work with work with youth, work with students. Um, we're doing a big project that we're launching soon that I've been working on since October. It's been sort of what I've been doing besides drawing, and I, I really can't wait to launch it. But they just they just do wonder work. And if anyone here has kids, and I know you have kids, all the projects are free. That that's the thing is we make them free and available to anybody online. So there's a website Amazing. that you can go to that it's just like yeah, it, especially now. I mean, kids are going through so much. Um, yeah. Well, and I, I think that, you know, and this, we don't have much time left, yeah, but yeah. Um, I think this is a, a, a conversation about creativity and, and how important it is to be taught in schools, how important it is to, to get throughout your entire life. I mean, Athenium was created out of me struggling in a variety of ways and I needed an outlet. I needed to connect with people. I needed to do something that made me feel worthy right um and so you know i think it's just such such a valuable thing that you all are doing with that work especially with young people who oh, are you. struggling with identity struggling with the world of be being literally on fire i i know as a as a kid who you know grew up in in some some difficult situations i was so reaching out to to any mentor anybody i could grab a hold to on onto to kind of help support me and be a uh, um, we'll leave it as support. <laughs> um, and it's just so, you know, that's, that's part of what drives me in connecting with young people too, is like, I know what it was like feeling like you, you were unsupported and you didn't fit in and finding that it, one, even one person, one person who takes a little bit of extra time to connect with you and whether it's, you know, a, a cr creative or a, I think creative creativity can be thought of in a lot of different ways that, that moment, even if it's a short period of time, is something that lives with you forever, forever. Um, and so that's why I, I take a lot of time whenever I'm around young people to like, to engage with them and to treat them, you know, like they are human beings uh, and yeah. that they have ideas and their ideas are valuable. Um, so, so obviously I'm very passionate about <laughs> no, this type yeah, of work. That's awesome. Yeah, um, no, it's great. And I, you know, it just makes me think back to something you said earlier about how like you like to draw. And I, I think a shame is that like everyone sort of, most people draw as kids, right. you know what I mean? I think, but then at a certain point, it's like, well, what are you going to do with that? You know what I mean? Like, and, and then they're encouraged not to draw anymore because it doesn't have value, but right. it does have value. You know what I mean? Like, and I, I just wish, and it's just a shame because it's like, again, that gives you an outlet. It's meditative. It's like, you know what I mean? Like, and so I wish, you know, I think it's, it's, I just wish that people would be encouraged to do that more or to write more. Or to, you know what I mean? Like to just be creative. And I mean, we can be creative in big and small ways. Putting your clothes on in the morning, you're being creative because you're deciding what you're going to be in the world. Like cooking a meal is creative. Um, right. 
you know, but I just think that that we, we miss a lot of that. I think that there's a lot of like, there's a lot of ways to have input now, like social media and movies and TV and video games. But I think we forget that like, you know, it's like if you have a, a balloon and you just fill it, eventually it explodes. If there's, if you don't ex, you know, like export some of that stuff <laughs> yeah. and creativity is a way for you to like healthily, like get that, get things out, you know? Yeah, for sure. For sure. There's a couple of things I want to get to before yeah. uh, before we close and we're at, we're at time. But uh, I wanted to first I wanted to say this conversation just makes me so happy that we work together. I, I, I know we, we 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 give a lot of affection to each other, but, uh, you know, I I'm so happy that we've been able to connect and, you know, that you trust me to, to sell your art, <laughs> which seems kind of silly. But, yeah, you know, it's like yeah, uh, it's I, I'm so proud of the work that you do. And um I just feel so grateful that that we've you you have helped me start this community. Start you you were so encouraging with this with this channel even. Um, so so thank you. It really it really it means a lot a lot to me. Thanks, and I appreciate. I mean, I, you know, not to just make it like a a doat fest or whatever. But like, <laughs> it's but really, Sean. Like, People I are leaving it because is, of this. <laughs> it is, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it is. I think that it is. I mean, this is this is more important now than probably in a very long time because it's like we're all we've been stuck, or some of us are still stuck, and it's just like again, it just uh, it, it's. I think what you're doing and that passion and that love is is great. And again, I can't wait to see how you how you grow. And again, hopefully, this you know maybe the next time we're able to do one of these chats, hopefully you've had dozens of chats with this other roster of, again, just like amazing, amazing artists that you've like been in contact with and who trust you because I think because of that passion, like, you know, you can kind of, you can kind of smell it when people don't have that heart or that, that genuine like love, you know what I mean? And I think you, you have it. And um, a lot of other people trust you, I think because of that, you know? Yeah. I, I try. <laughs> so um, with a few minutes we have left, I, I wanted to give you some time to talk about your new book. I'm really excited. Like I said, I love the love the title. Um, I think about seventh grade and how much I, I did not like seventh grade. <laughs> so I'm curious what your perspective uh, is on it. But I, I wonder if you could give us a little bit of a, uh, a preview of Tales of a Seventh Grade Lizard Boy. Yeah. So, well, I guess I know that some people, you know, so some people might be bummed that it's my next book is not the second half of it. <laughs> um, that, is the number one, that is the number one question that I get from like, I'll get an email from someone like a high schooler. that's like, Oh my God, I found this book in the library. I love it. Um, when is this next book coming? And um, it's not, it's on the back burner for now, but um, so this is a different book, um, but it is about a family of lizard people that you live under the earth and had to escape because of war and lack of resources and things like that. And so, but they can change their skin to, um, if anyone watched the, um, the television show V yes. in the eighties as kids, like that was hugely influential in a scary way for me. I was scared to death of that show, but um, you know, there's like a trope of like lizard people invading, you know, and that's rooted in, you know, anti-Semitism and stuff, but it's just, it's a science fiction trope of like othering. It's a way to other, right. but you know, part of me was like, I mean, so the book is inspired by sort of two things. It's about sort of like um, my family's experience as Vietnamese immigrants and the immigrant experience. And not just that, but just like the experience we all face of just like literally like, you know, when they came to this country, you know, my uncle was like 11 years old, 12 years old, and he didn't speak English. He's in this new world and he's trying to adapt. And he's like, what are you, what do you, how much do you want to fit in? How do you fit in? And what do you, what do you give up when you try to fit in? You know what I mean? I think that those are a lot of questions that a lot of people face, but not just immigrants, but also like, you know, all of us sort of put a mask on to fit in, in some ways. And you know what I mean? Like, how do you, right. how do you deal with that? And also like how much, how important it is when you find people that just let you be who you are and love you who you are, you know? So it's about that, but also it was sort of inspired by science fiction, this trope, right. Of like, you know, because it made me think of media portrayal and how, like, how that is effect on us. So like, you know, if you're like, you know, if you're a black kid growing around America and all you see on TV is the black, black person being like, you know, the gang member or the, yeah. the thug or whatever, like you grow up and you're like, well, this is all I see I can be, you know, how does that affect how you go into the world? But then it made me think of what if there were like a lizard family who like, they 
were just trying to fit in and they're just trying to live their life. And then everywhere is showing them as these monsters, these creatures, these sort of like, you know, insidious sort of like element. And so how does that affect you sort of like trying to make your place in the world? So anyhow, that was all of it. I, that was, but it's, it's coming out. It's for, this is for middle readers. Um, and so it's very different, but I'm just really excited about it because I think it's a more, Odessa has a lot of me in it. But yeah. this has a lot of me in it. I mean, I guess all authors' books have a lot of them in it. But just like, I love that I was able to take all these different elements and put it in together in a story. Like, I'm still kind of amazed that, because I used to joke about, like, I'm going to do a story about lizard people. Uh, <laughs> and then I never, and now here it is coming out. And I'm like so excited for it. <laughs> Sometimes the best ideas are those like throwaway, like, this would be silly if I did this. And then you're like, what if I did do it? How amazing well, would that be? Yeah, it's, well, it's, it's <laughs> funny too, because it started, like there's a panel in Americas of a lizard person. And it's like the coolest thing I've ever drawn. It's the only original piece of art that I like, like want to keep for myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, and that's where it started. It just started as a joke. And then it, and yeah, here it is like a decade later. And then now it's like a, it's going to be a book, so. Well, I'm so excited to, to pick it up. Um, pre-order it. My publisher, my editor will probably be very happy. You can pre-order it from anywhere. Get it from your local comic shop or bookstore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Before I forget, one of the things we wanted to do, I don't know if you've been following us on social media, uh, Jonathan um, was very kind in sending me some signed and sketched. It's hard to do this, isn't it? Signed <laughs> and sketched uh, copies of Odessa and um, I'm actually not sure how to track people who, who've come to watch it live other than in the, the comments. Um, so what we're going to do is give away one of these books for free to, to one of you folks who were uh, kind enough to watch us live tonight. Uh, it would be really helpful if you leave a comment <laughs> so I can uh, make sure I track you. But um, I'll contact you in the next few days uh, if you have won. So thank you so much for for joining us tonight. Uh, Jonathan, where where can folks find you? I know we've talked about the pro problematic uh, oh, yeah, no, nature I'm... of social media, but where can folks find you? Oh, yeah. Um, just one of the Johns. Um, it's O-N-E-O-F-J-O-H-N-S, even though there's not a Johns in my name. It's sort of like a metaphorical, like, you know, one of the Johns. Uh, and that's on Twitter and Instagram and um, anywhere that you can find me, that's where I'm at. So Awesome. I wanted to, uh, hopefully I can do this fairly quickly um, before before we get off. So uh, I uh, run a art rep website where you can buy original art, including art from uh, Jonathan. I want to pull out. It's so big. It's hard to fit. Uh, it's uh, nine by nine by seventeen. These pages, the only uh, original pages that exist from Odessa. Um, and if you are interested, I, I love this is one of my favorite pages. I kind of it's hard for me. You, you you don't partake in what you in you sell. Um, <laughs> so luckily, I bought pages before <laughs> before we started this partnership. But um, if you want to buy a piece from Jonathan, go ahead to uh, atheniumcomicart.com. And uh, we got some really amazing ones um, still available. So, Jonathan, thank you so much. This was a wonderful conversation. I feel like we have so much more to talk about, as we always do. Uh, we we uh, we have very long conversations, and I always so enjoy talking to you. Thank you so much for for joining me tonight. And um, as as always, thanks for the 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 support in all of my projects. I really appreciate it. Yeah. No. Thank you for having me, Sean. Again, it's a wonderful, you know. A wonderful great opportunity just to sit down and talk with you and um you know yeah it'll be i i can't wait to see where it goes and see who you have on next <laughs> yeah i need to slow down um <laughs> yeah, yeah give it some time give it some time it's yeah, not going it anywhere yeah, yeah yeah well thank you everyone again and uh hopefully we'll be doing this uh with a with another artist in a few weeks so awesome all right Thanks, have everyone. a nice night bye